Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so lovely to be here in front of you all this morning. And it's great to see everybody on Zoom. You're about an inch square, I'm afraid, everybody on Zoom, but it's great to see you. It's really wonderful, wonderful to be here. St. Lawrence's morning service. It's just fantastic to spend time being with God and with each other. We're looking at uh, a section of the Live Lent book this morning. Uh, we've all had one, I hope. And um, it uni unites us across Biddulph, but across the whole of the Church of England. People are studying together. Even though we're separated by the coronavirus restrictions, we can study God's word together. And uh, we're looking at the, the section week three, communicating like Jesus. And Shuf's going to be speaking to us this morning about that, about Jesus speaking at the well to a, a Samaritan woman. And can I encourage you to use your book, even if you haven't used it so far. It's really easy. The sections are very short. It's very accessible. And it prepares us for our Sunday service because that's the topic we're following. We're following each topic on a Sunday from this book. There is also a family service going on at the moment uh, via YouTube that Jane is uh, leading. So if you're wondering where our young people and families are, there's a family service on at the same time as this one via YouTube. I'm Lisa, I'm a member of St. Lawrence's. I'm here with my husband, Darren. He's here to make sure that I mute and unmute when I'm supposed to. So it's his fault if I get it wrong. Let's have a moment just to spend some time before God, before we start. It says in the Bible that our hope is an anchor for our soul. May we each anchor ourselves in Christ Jesus this morning, forgetting the distractions of the week that's just gone, the stuff we have to do today, and the week we have ahead and just give God these few minutes this morning to him. We'll be following the words on our service sheet with you joining in in bold. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. For that is his nature. Wow. wow. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of worship together today. Lord Jesus, though we are scattered, worshiping in our homes, and here in church, confirm in us afresh the deep truth that we are the church, that we are your body. Lord Jesus, we come together to worship you. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our first song together, My Jesus, My Saviour.
We now come to that time where we think a little about ourselves and the kind of week we've had this week. And we say sorry to God, drawing a line under what's been and starting afresh with him. Let's say together our confession. Father God, we are sorry for the things we do and say and think, which make you sad. We are sorry for putting ourselves before the needs of others. Please forgive us and help us to love you and other people more and more. Amen. We can be assured of God's forgiveness, for God forgives us. Let us forgive others. Let us forgive ourselves. Through Jesus, God has put away our sin. Let us approach our God in peace, in the power of the Spirit, and through Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. We have our first Bible reading. And Anita's going to read from Matthew for us. You there, Anita? Uh, yes, thank okay. you. The reading from Matthew 11, verses 16 to 19. To what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Thank you, Anita. And our second reading, is by Andrew and Anisam on Zoom from John 4. You there, Andrew? Hi. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, 
I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is the word of the Lord. Just now going to come and speak to us about that passage. And before he does, I'm just going to pray for him. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Shuf as he brings uh, this passage alive to us. And all he has to say, uh, Father, may you bless it. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm sort of going to speak on that passage. I shall refer to it later on, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. It's great to see so many people in church and so many people on Zoom and YouTube this morning. Before I begin, let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, this morning, open our ears to hear what you're saying. Open our minds to think about you. Open our hearts and help us to be changed by you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. When Jesus entered our world, he didn't box himself inside the four walls of a synagogue. He walked into the life of sinners. He touched the lepers. He associated with prostitutes. He dined with the despised. He scandalized the religious community by stepping into the world. In order for Jesus to reach and rescue the world, he had to step into it to gate crash it. And in the same way for us to impact and influence the world for Jesus, we must also do the same thing. We must step into it. We must gate crash it. John Stott said, we are to go as he went to penetrate human society, to mix with unbelievers, and fraternize with sinners. Does not one of the church's greatest failures lie here? We've disengaged too much. We've become withdrawn, a withdrawn community. We've become aloof rather than alongside. On Sunday, the church gathers, but from Monday to Saturday, we, the church, scatter into the marketplace and into every corner of the world. Followers of Jesus Christ live as God's ambas ambassadors. We are his representatives, his messengers. We are, or we should be, on mission. The American theologian R.C. Sproul described the mission to the marketplace. He said, Jesus' strategy always involved believers going into the world to penetrate the marketplace. Followers of Jesus must recognize their ministry and mission of communicating God's love to people they come into contact with each day. And our first reading, which is in tomorrow's section of the Live Lent booklet, is a picture of life in the marketplace. 
a place where there's not just buying and selling going on, but all human life is there. And it pictures a lot of dissatisfaction. One group encouraging another to be happy. We played the flute for you. And the other group not dancing. In other words, saying, we feel like being sad. And a further group wailing and playing a dirge to be contradicted by a further group saying, oh, we want to be happy. And it's a description of many in the world today, dissatisfaction, argument, and criticism all around. No one's happy. That reading reminds us that John the Baptist couldn't do right for doing wrong in some people's eyes, and neither could Jesus. Now, I wonder whether some of you know what this is. Let me just see if I can get it in frame there. It is a ferry. Some people here won't know where that ferry is. It's actually a ferry in Kenya. It's the Lakoni ferry in uh, Mombasa. And those of us who went to Kenya and have been to Kenya before have experienced this ferry. Uh, the last one we went in 2019, the group of us, it was an interesting experience. We only experienced it briefly for two times and didn't really see it to its full. But I was going to use the word potential, but perhaps that isn't quite the word. Here's another picture of it. This is what it actually looks like when it's, when it's loaded. Can we see that? Hang on, I'm making you seasick. There, <laughs> there we are. Absolutely full of people you can see there. It's bustling with traders, traveling to, from, from one part, from, the, from Mombasa Island to the south coast. It's bustling with people who work in Mombasa, with lorries and vans and motorbikes, tourist buses, and of course pedestrians, loads of pedestrians, too many pedestrians really in actual fact. Some ferries carry vehicles only, some foot passengers only, but most carry a mixture of both and they get very, very crowded. I've had the experience of traveling as a foot passenger and it's not particularly pleasant, but it's free. <laughs> Before you board the ferry, you join a huge queue. I tried to find a photograph of the queue. And it is an absolutely enormous queue. Everybody squashed together there. It's more a squash than a queue. And as you can imagine, because the weather's hot and humid, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. The wait can be anything from 15 minutes to an hour. And while you're waiting, traders from the local market, um, which is beside the road, will attempt to sell you drinks, fresh fruit, bananas, mosquito zappers, sunglasses, and all manner of things. It's very, very noisy. And perhaps the biggest noise comes from the man with the megaphone, who's usually shouting out verses from the Bible, usually verses about the end times, and telling people that unless they're saved now, they are doomed. It's a high volume version of the man or woman with the sandwich board that says, the end is now. But maybe the message is timely because sometimes this happens. And there have been, I didn't tell the people who were going to Kenya, but there have been, <laughs> there have been lots of accidents on, the, <laughs> on this ferry. Sometimes that happens. The thing is, though, that most people seem to be ignoring the man with the megaphone and many seem to be listening to something quite different on their own headsets. It's impossible to talk. And when I hear all this and see all this going on, it often makes me think, would Jesus have picked up a megaphone and done it in this way? And I think probably not. The theme of week three's um, thoughts in the Live Lent booklet is communicating like Jesus. And there's so much that can be said about the way in which Jesus interacted with the people. 
far too much for one sermon. But today, I just want to think about three different ways. And perhaps during the week, we can give some thought to these three ways. I began by talking about the marketplace, and Jesus spent a lot of his time there. And as I said, all human life is in the marketplace. Like the man with the megaphone, Jesus went, people, went where people were, but rather than shouting, he shared his life with them. Of his 132 public appearances, 122 had links to the marketplace. The four gospels record Jesus telling 52 parables, and of those 45 had a marketplace context. Now, in case you think you've heard those figures before, you probably have, because I mentioned them last May. And you need to have good memories to remember this. <laughs> but I mentioned this in a, in, a, in a sermon which was called What Would Jesus Post? And we were talking about social media at the time. I almost thought I could re repeat that sermon today, but you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to. But in it, I just argue that for many people, social media is their marketplace. And I will repeat that if social media is your marketplace, your meeting place, that's perhaps where your mission should be. Jesus rarely shouted at people. When I wrote that down first time, I wrote Jesus didn't shout at people. But then if you look at the reading, it's the set reading for today. It's actually the cleansing of the temple when Jesus threw the money, the money traders out of the temple. I'm sure he probably did a bit of shouting then. So I will say he rarely shouted. He told stories, parables. He healed people. People had heard about him. They wanted to know where he was. They sought him out. He often drew a crowd, not because of the noise he was making, because, but because of who he was, because of the way in which he lived his life. And so the first of the three points that I want to make this morning is this. It's a short one. As we communicate the good news, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Initially, people are much more likely to hear what we have to say about Jesus through the example of our life and of our actions, rather than through the words we speak. This weekend's thoughts in the Live Lent book uh, contain these words by Ralph Waldo Emerson. What you do, speak, what, sorry, what you do speaks loud, so loudly that I can't hear what you're saying. And it's true, isn't it? If our actions, if our lives are affected and guided by our love for Jesus, people are much more likely to be receptive when we start to talk to them about him. In his care for others, in his stories, in his miracles, and in his healings, this was Jesus' way. Actions speak louder than words. And the second point is that Jesus was willing to change his plans and spend time with people to communicate the good news. And so should we. Jesus was willing to change his plans and spend time with people to communicate the good news. And so should we. I almost had the story of Zacchaeus for one of my readings, but he decided not to because I figure we know the story quite well, really. Luke 19 tells us that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, but passed through Jericho on the way. Passed through Jericho. Probably wasn't intending to stop, but as he passed through, here was that tax collector, Zacchaeus, up in the tree, trying to get a glimpse of him. Jesus looks up, changes his plans, and invites himself to Zacchaeus' house for tea, much to the disgust of the crowd around who loan with tax collectors. Jesus had sensed a need. Zacchaeus needed a saviour, and so Jesus was willing to change his plans and make time for him. 
And as a result, Zacchaeus became a different man. He met the Saviour. His heart and his actions were transformed and those around about him marvelled. Back to Kenya for a minute. When I first travelled there back in 1995, which seems a long time ago now, uh, when I first visited Siongila, I remember being irritated by people's poor timekeeping. We'll be there by 10 o'clock, people said. I got ready at about half past nine because I like to be early. By 12 o'clock, I was still waiting. At one o'clock, if I was lucky, they might arrive. So one day I decided that I would challenge somebody about this. And this is what they said to me. It's more important to stop and talk with people on the way than it is to meet you at 10 o'clock. It may be the last time we see them. And it made me think. We shouldn't make our plans our straitjacket. We need to be flexible so that we can spend time with them and to communicate the good news of Jesus with those whom God wants us to spend time. And, and at a time that he wants us to do it. Otherwise, we might be too late. It's difficult, isn't it? It's a challenge, but it's true. Jesus is willing to change his plans and spend time with people to communicate the good news, and so should we. Now to that second reading of the woman at the well. And really, I'm not going to talk very much about this because there is loads of stuff in it, really. But it's a woman whose encounter with Jesus, just like it did with Zacchaeus, led to a changed life. But just for now, I want to look at the event from Jesus' point of view. And my third point is this. We sometimes have to make ourselves vulnerable to communicate the good news. Now this is picked up in Friday's section in the Live Lent booklet. In the story of Zacchaeus, we've already seen that Jesus is willing to make himself vulnerable. By visiting Zacchaeus' house, he'd incurred the wrath of those who came to see him. But here, things are taken to a different level. In those days, it was very unseemly for a man, particularly a teacher, to engage in casual conversation with a woman. It was even more unseemly because he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. And it was still more unseemly because she'd had multiple husbands. And yet, Jesus perceived a need and was willing to take a risk. In a world where so many are in need of the good news of Jesus, it can be difficult to know where to begin or where to go next. Right at the very beginning of the Live Lent booklet, we read Archbishop Rowan Williams's words. Mission, he says, is finding out about what God is doing and then joining in. How do we find this out? Well, we pray. We ask God to show us. We're patient, we listen. And when, like Jesus, we perceive that need, we act, even if it makes us vulnerable. And Jesus made himself even more vulnerable by asking something of her. Give me a drink, he said. The whole of this story employs a fascinating use of questions. When you have time, read it all through. There are bits that are missed out of our reading today, but just read it all through. Jesus didn't shout at her. He didn't use strong words with her. He didn't tell her that her life was all wrong and that she'd made a mess of everything. She already knew that. 
Instead, he gently led her to accept her current situation and then, equally as gently, offered her a way of salvation. And she became a changed person. Jesus had made himself vulnerable to the wrath of the religious leaders, but through the offer of living water, her life had been transformed. Salvation came to this woman. Back in my youth, which is a long time ago, there were lots of crusades that went on where the speaker would stand at the front and shouting rather than like the man at the Laconic Ferry, would try to encourage people to follow Jesus. Even today, I see some tele-evangelists who adopt the same method. And sometimes this does lead to new disciples. But as time has gone on, I've realized that in yours and in my dealings with people, in communicating the good news of the gospel, our starting point should always be to get alongside them like Jesus did, even if it makes us vulnerable. We sometimes have to make ourselves vulnerable to communicate the good news. So, three points. As we communicate the good news, actions speak louder than words. Jesus was willing to change his plans and spend time with people to communicate the good news, and so should we. And we sometimes have to make ourselves vulnerable to communicate the good news. Now, I don't know about you, but this can all seem rather daunting, a bit scary, really. And so I think it's quite important to remember that in all of this, we're not alone. First of all, Jesus is with us by his spirit. We promise that in his word in Matthew 28 Verse 20, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. As we pray, if we listen, when we follow, he can give us the strength, the inner resources we need to share the good news in the way in which we live our lives. And the second thing is that we have one another as church we're family together, and the best families encourage each other, build one another up, and help each other. We're not doing this alone. We're all in it together. As we work through the Live Lent studies this week, let's pray for each other, that we may look to Jesus as we seek to communicate like him. And here's a challenge. Maybe you and I can think of one other person, perhaps somebody out that's in this church this morning or somebody that we can see on Zoom today. And perhaps we could pray for them each day this week as they visit their marketplace, wherever that may be. And as they endeavor to communicate to, the, to those they meet, just like Jesus did. Let's pray together. This is a prayer also from the Live Lent booklet. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the good shepherd. Help me to know your gentle guidance in my life. And help me to draw others to be part of that sheepfold. Amen. And now Maggie is going to lead us in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Let us pray in spirit and in truth to our God, our loving Heavenly Father, in faith that he will hear our prayers and respond to the needs for those for whom we pray. 
Heavenly Father, we pray that you will pour out the living water of your spirit upon your church in the world. Give us the humility and courage to seek unity where we are divided. Give us the grace to exclude no one from fellowship because we disapprove of their way of life or the expression of their faith. Remind us always that it is only through your gracious love that we can find peace with you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will pour out the living water of your spirit upon the nations of the world. Help us to find new non-violent ways of seeking peace and reconciliation. Give grace, wisdom and insight to the powerful that they may surrender some of their power. To the rich that they may surrender some of their wealth. And to those who express hatred and prejudice through violence to learn that there are better ways to be. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will pour out the living water of your spirit upon our communities and our families. Help us to allow that living water to flow through us, enabling us to reach out to those around us. Help us not to be afraid to show kindness to strangers or to stand alongside those on the edges of our society. Give to us the spirit that was in Jesus, drawing people to him and uniting them in their common experience of his compassion and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will pour out the living water of your spirit upon all who are in need. We pray for those who face another day of pain, fear, loneliness, depression, or anxiety. Let them find in you refreshment, hope, and comfort for their spirit, and the peace of mind that comes with the assurance of your presence alongside them. Amen. And as we think about communicating like Jesus, I found this and thought it might be helpful to take some time to consider what our world could actually be like. If we had a fraction of the faith in you that you have in us, then this world would be transformed. If we showed a fraction of the love that you show to us, then this world would be transformed. If we share just a portion of the blessings that we have received from you, then this world would be transformed. If we showed as much trust in others as you have shown in us, then this world would be transformed. If we claimed just a fraction of the power you promised to your church, then this world would be transformed. Transform us first, Lord, that we might transfer this, transform this world through your love and power. Amen. Something very close to my heart. We all know that schools start again tomorrow for most of our children and young people. So let us uphold them in our prayers along with the teaching and support staff in our schools.
Lord Jesus, we pray for all those returning to school tomorrow. Still any fears they may have. Fill them with hope and joy at meeting up with their friends and teachers. We pray that they can settle back into routines quickly and that the safety measures in place will be effective and our communities will stay well. Thank you for all the efforts of homeschooling that parents have done and pray for the teachers now who will continue to help our children and young people in their learning. Amen. We give thanks for the continuing vaccine rollout and the reductions of infections and hospitalizations. We ask that you will sustain all those involved in our health service. We thank you for the skill of those researching new variants and developing further vaccines. And Father, we ask for fairness in the distribution of the vaccine across the globe. Amen. I know in the family service this morning, they have been exploring the theme of the whole armor of God. And my final prayer for this week would be that we can all put on the armor of God and know that he will protect us, he will guide us, and he will direct us. Father, may you be a real present in our lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's just continue with the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So thank you, Shuf, and thank you, Maggie, for our prayers. We've certainly been given a lot to think about. Let us remember Shuf's encouragement to pray for one another this week as we go out and communicate about Jesus. And Maggie's challenge that if we gave just a fraction of the love that Jesus has for us, then the world would be transformed. Two things to think on this week. So as I introduce you to our last song of the service, let's not think of it as the last song, but the first song of a new week. Let's declare our faith this week for the next seven days until we meet again. So let's well, at home, sing together, when I survey the wondrous cross, and those in the church, let's mumble as loud as we can into our face masks.
Please sit down. Thank you. It's now time to share as a church um, some of the things that we've perhaps got going on in our lives, birthdays, things to pray about. Um, do we have anyone on Zoom who has a birthday? Yes. Uh, Anita. Fantastic. Hi, Anita. Tomorrow. On Monday. Is there anybody in church with a birthday or anything to pray? Any prayer requests? Is there anybody else on Zoom? I've got a tip off that it might be Ros Milner's birthday. Is Ros on Zoom? She's gone to the family service. It's my birthday, Lisa. Oh, oh, hello. Who's... <laughs> so you're going to have to remind me of your name, I'm sorry. Michael. Michael's got some tests this this yeah, test last week. Yes. Thank you. He's yes. got some... Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So for those on Zoom, uh, Michael just uh, shared that he had um, some tests last week um, and he's waiting for the results. Uh, so if you could pray for him uh, during that uncertain time. Anybody else on Zoom with prayer requests? Okay, is, is John there? Can we sing to Anita nice and loud? <laughs> it's uh, Anita Ross, and he forgot it's his wife's birthday on Tuesday. Anita Ross and Alison. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy We'll just take a moment to pray for Michael as well while, while we can. Um, just pray for Michael as he waits for um, this appointment next week and for the examination. Just pray that you'll be with him and give him all the patience and all the certainty and assurance that he needs, Father, and for the right treatment and that you'll just be with him this week. Amen. Amen. We're at St. Lawrence's in the middle of a vacancy, which means we're without a leader, without a minister. And um, we've got this wonderful prayer that we've been saying together uh, each week. But I encourage you to pray it at home also. It's not just for in church and it's not just for on a Sunday. And it's really important that we pray for um, the process and the appointment of a new vicar because God wants to hear our prayers and he wants to be in the appointment process. So we need to invite him in to be with us. We heard the great news last week from Assistant Archdeacon Terry Bloor that the process can start here for the appointment of a new vicar. And that's answered prayer. That's great news because that wasn't necessarily going to be the case, but the, may, the way has been made plain for that to happen. So we're very grateful. And it's so important that we keep praying this prayer. So I'm going to say it on behalf of all of us, but please at home say it out loud or say it into your masks here, but I'm going to say it on behalf of all of us. Almighty God, to whom we bring our worship and praise, hear our prayer for the parish and congregation of St. Lawrence's Biddulph. Give us discernment to recognize the gifts and ministries you have given to each one of us, together with the grace to exercise them in harmony with one another and for the good of all. Sustain those working to serve you 
and others during this vacancy, guiding them with wisdom and integrity, that your will may be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we have patience in waiting the appointment and arrival of your new leader for our parish and give support to those responsible for choosing that person. May we trust you, the God of faithfulness and generosity, to lead us through this time of transition and change so that we are ready to enter a new chapter in the life of our parish for the glory of your name and the growth of your kingdom. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Lindsay has some notices and some bands for us. <clears throat> There's a couple of notices, and then I'll read the bands. I don't know whether any of you have been on a prayer walk yet, but it's well worth doing. And uh, there's a notice about that on the back of the sheet. Uh, please, all it means is go for a walk with somebody and pray along the way. It's not that difficult. And you see some interesting things as you walk around, which we discovered last week as we saw a whole gathering of frogs. Not that we prayed for them, but it was an interesting experience. Uh, and, and it's God's wonderful world at the end of the day, isn't it? So uh, it's not wrong to do to spot things and just stop and reflect. Uh, the other thing is, uh, those that have come to church have probably seen it on the door, that coming up at the end of April, we will be having the ACPM, I get my letters modelled up, but the annual meeting. And because of that, we have to just check that our electoral roll is correct and uh, check whether you're on it, check whether the details are correct, check if you need to come off it. Um, all those things need to be done and Carl's in charge of that. So please get in touch with him if there's any problems or anything you need to uh, check with the electoral roll because two weeks before the actual meeting, the electoral roll is closed down. So you won't be able to vote at the meeting or anything if you're not on there. So please just uh, get that sorted. And uh, we, it isn't so very long since we did all that uh, because we didn't have our meeting till late, but uh, I'm sure there'll be the odd person that thinks, oh, well, I should put my name on there. So please do, because that's when you can, you vote at the annual meeting for the different people and you can't vote if you're not on it. Okay, so I'm going to pu publish the bands of marriage between Jonathan, Peter Barry, and Hayley Underwood. And they're both of this parish, and this is for the second time of asking. So if any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. And what I'm going to do now is just stop for a moment and we think about Jonathan and Haley as they prepare for a wedding that's going to be quite different uh, because they're, they're having the wedding on the 1st of May. So they can only have so many people at the wedding and they can't have a reception. But they believe that getting married is the important thing and that I do uh, praise them for that. So let's pray for them. Father, we thank you for Jonathan and Haley. We thank you that they want to get married, and even though there are restrictions, they want to be married, and I ask that you'll be very close to them in their preparation, and you'll be close to them that they remember that you are part of their lives and part of their marriage, and Father, just ask that you will bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. And so let's have a closing prayer. Eternal giver of love and life, your son Jesus Christ has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. There's an opportunity now for those on Zoom to enter into a breakout group if they wish. It's just a matter of um, holding on there and waiting and you'll be put into a group automatically. The rest of us in church, we have to remain socially distanced with our masks on and we will be leaving the, the building. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, 